Yo, yo, yo. Welcome back to another edition of the When Words Don't Come Easy podcast. So happy to have you with me. Again, if this is your first time or you haven't met me yet, my name is Andy Howard, and I am so glad that you're here. Uh, today I'm flying solo, so hopefully that is cool with you. I just want to spend a few minutes with you uh, going over one of the chapters of my latest book, When Words Don't Come Easy. Uh, you can find out more information at andyhoward.com. Uh, it's available at Amazon, uh, both in hardback or paperback edition, or the Audible uh, at audible.com. And if you're a Kindle person, hey, we got you covered there as well. But again, any other information you need, or if you'd love to sign up on my mailing uh, my mailing list <laughs> for the latest news, please do so at andyhoward.com. So I'm just glad you're here. Going to have some uh, just a few minutes to kind of dive into chapter five, and that's stuck. And we talk about stuck, but I was running this morning. This is kind of heavy. It's heavy for me. I still deal with this, even after all the years of, of contending with my mental health and with depression and all the things. And, and it's a journey. I say that because I, I want you to know if our pastor said it from the stage this weekend, he said, it's okay to not feel okay. And so many times, like we put like these happy faces on and put our smiles on and everything's perfect that you may be feeling like, well, man, I'm having kind of a crappy day. I don't feel so good. So something's wrong with me. And I just want to say, man, that, that's hogwash. <laughs> hogwash is some old school East Texan term where I'm from. That just means it. It's bullcorn. That's another one. <laughs> well, hey, over the over the few weeks, you will learn a lot of new words if you stick around with me. But just know, we know this from the beginning. The devil is a liar. In fact, you know, John 8, he talks about he, he's the father of lies. The devil, that, that's all he knows to do, right? When he speaks, he's lying. So I want to talk about enough today enough right enough that that word is alone there's so many different ways we could go with it but for me lately i've been hearing are you enough are you enough well, what does that even mean enough for what that's like even in the beginning days when there's adam and eve and here comes that dang devil <laughs> dang devil that sounds like my wife tiff love her dearly but here he comes. Hey, did did God really say you couldn't eat from this tree? I wonder why he doesn't want you to eat from this tree. Man, this apple must be amazing if he doesn't want you to eat this apple, right? Now he's slipping in here and he's saying, are you enough? Are you good enough? Do you fit in or even belong here? Here's the deal, man. God has no ranking system, whether it's with sins. And I love that. I'm grateful for that. Like he doesn't have these big sins or little sins. It's Sin is sin, right? Same thing with ranks. And I love ranks, man. I, I love that companies that have like these ranks and, and you get recognized for hitting certain ranks, at least as an entrepreneur, right? As you're, as you're climbing the ladder, as you're doing things. I've seen like all these little, I don't know, silver star thing. And I'm, I'm a dash member and I, I'm kind of going off the top of my head, just making up random stuff, but we have them too in our company. I totally get it. I understand. The deal is when you get to heaven, like those ranks mean nothing. Right. And I shouldn't say when you get to heaven, when, when you die, let's put it that way. When you die, in, in your standing at, at judgment day. Those ranks mean nothing. The only thing that matters, and that's, are you enough? Well, there's nothing that you on your own can do to, to be enough. 
And I'm going to dive into that uh, throughout the rest of this. But the very first thing I do want to talk about is about two different Elishas. I love the one about Elisha Otis, and I'm just going to read this straight from my book. And I, uh, if you'll give me a second, I want to pull it up on screen. Could I, I just want to read it actually from, sorry, take it back to Elisha from the Bible. And this is actually found in 2 Kings. This, this dude, Elisha, 2 Kings Elisha here, I think he was our first, um, what you could say, essential oils <laughs> person, pusher. I say that, hey, trust me, if you could see my wife's bathroom right now, you would know that I love the essential oils people. I love them dearly because it's everywhere. Like Tiff loves the stuff and she is not a, she's not a, what do you call them? A, a seller, I guess, salesman for essential oils, but she loves them. So here we go. I digress. We're going to second Kings. We find our first essential oil, oils seller and here he is. It's Elisha. See, once upon a time, there was a widow. Her husband had loved the Lord, but he was gone. And she was on her own with just her two sons and a lot of debt. One day, a man of God, a prophet, came by. His name was Elisha, the essential oils guy. My husband is dead, she cried out to the prophet. You know he loved the Lord, but now his creditors are coming. I have nothing to give them, nothing. Nothing. They're going to take my two sons as slaves in payment. Look, I've had a lot of bad days in my life. But I have never been at a spot where if I did not have enough money, I was about to lose my, my three daughters. I cannot imagine what she is thinking here. Here he comes. What do you have that we can sell? He asked her. Said Joy Oils guy. <laughs> Trust me here. What part of, I have nothing, didn't you understand? I'm paraphrasing a bit here. Surely you have something. I'm stuck. All I have is a jar with some olive oil in it. Now picture her position. She's going to attempt to barter for the lives of her children with a ceramic jar of olive oil. I can't even begin to imagine the level of fear and desperation. We're good, Elisha told her. We are good. That is all you need. Go around and ask your neighbors for all their empty jars. She looked at him, maybe a bit frustrated, thinking he was missing the picture. Don't ask for a few. Seriously, get as many as you can. We need a lot, he continued. Then get them all together and pour your oil into the jars. Once it is full, set it aside. Send your oils. Watch this. I have no idea what the widow was thinking while she obeyed Elisha. Maybe she felt a bit like Elisha Otis. Now, Elisha Otis was this dude back in the day in New York City. I want to say early 1800s. He created this little contraption thingy, <laughs> emergency break, if nothing else, that would, would help uh, stop elevators, right? Like before he came along, these elevators were all on just one single strand of rope. I mean, it was a pretty thick rope, but still they, they were mainly used just for machinery. Uh, they didn't want, people didn't trust them enough to actually get on them and use, use them as elevators like we know them today. So here's Elisha. He believes in it, Elisha Otis. He believes in the system he's come up with that he is willing to put his life on the line. He just needs to show that it works. So he's in front of everybody at, at this big town fair in, in New York City, and he's prepared to cut the rope. He's dangling in front of everybody, knowing that as he cuts the rope, if his new uh, emergency brake dilly, <laughs> telling you, you're going to get high quality words from me here. If it doesn't work, he is going to go splat right in front of everybody. Can you imagine just dangling there with that kind of pressure? Maybe that's how, how this poor widow felt. Maybe she wondered about his grasp on the situation. Who knows? But the point is that she did what he told her to do. She was obedient. 
and she poured her oil into the first jar that she had gathered. Then it was full. Then she poured into another and another and another. And she asked her sons to get more jars, but pretty soon they had all the jars that they could scrounge up and everything was full. At this point, the oil stopped flowing. There you go, Elisha said. You can go sell the oil and pay off your debts. You and your sons can live on the rest. Straight from 2 Kings is a true story. How cool is that? How cool is that? Again, God provided. So here's Elisha Otis standing in front of the whole town with an ideal that he had, but he had to put in the action. To what I create, was it enough? What if it's not? What a big moment, right? So what did he do? He cut the rope. He cut the rope, and at that moment, bam, his new contraption that he had created worked in front of everybody. And it changed life as we know it. Let me scroll up here because it's also in my book earlier. I mentioned, so this was around 1908, right? In 1908, there was only 538 skyscrapers in New York City. And it's been said now that the Otis Elevator Company moves the entire population of the earth every three days. In New York City alone, more than three million people ride in his elevators. I'm guessing Otis had some moments of significant fear during this whole process. Fear that he was wrong, fear that no one would listen, fear that his, his ideal would fail. But despite all of the people telling him no, he didn't stay stuck. He saw the safety rope as the barrier between him and success. And he cut the rope. Isn't that cool? I'll be honest with you. I still don't think I'm enough. Like, what in the world am I even doing here on this podcast with you today? It takes every ounce of courage for me every single time I do this to push the record button and start this thing. Cause I know there are so many more people more gifted than me. There are so many more people more talented than me. There are so many more people more qualified than me to be doing this. So why do I do it? Because I feel in my heart of hearts that God has called me. If I can just help one more person like Andy Howard, who was stuck in bed, didn't want to get out, didn't want to face the day, didn't want to get out of the darkness and see light because of my depression. If I can help one more person have the courage to step out and, and trust that today is going to be better, trust that he is enough, then it's worth it. It's worth it. If one person, seriously, I, I would love to say, yeah, this, this podcast will blow up and go viral and help thousands or thousands. But even if it just helps one person, if I get one text from somebody that says, dude, you being vulnerable saved my life. Dang. Then it's worth it. My whole life, I've struggled with not being enough. And, and I, I've talked about this in the book as well, if you've had a chance to read it. But I, I'm number five. <laughs> I'm number five on the long list of Howard boys. So uh, I'm the baby of the family. But there was four amazing brothers ahead of me. And dude, they were the best. They never made me feel inadequate. They never put me down because I was the baby. My parents never treated me any different because I was the baby. But for some reason, I hear these lies of the enemy since I was young saying, dude, are you enough? How are you going to stick out in this family? How are you going to make a name for yourself when you're the fifth one to come along and all your other four brothers, I kid you not, are freaking rock stars. They're just awesome people. And so I have this own weight that I bear, that you're just number five. 
I've been trying to prove myself my whole life as a youth pastor or pastor in general. My brothers were all pastors and I would go hear them preach and it was amazing. I'm not, I'm not being biased here. They're just phenomenal people. So again, it's like, can I do that? Again, it's not supposed to be about me, but just being real, we're all human. We all have our own uh, doubts, our own fears that we face. To my own church staff, man, uh, and I know, again, it's in the book, <laughs> but if you've ever done the personality test and all the things, and and this was never meant as a bad thing. Again, I I, I hear words and I take them on and, and I, I hear tones and they used to say, oh, my little golden retriever and things like that, because of this one particular test that I did, uh, you had, you know, you had like, gosh, I don't know, the, the otter and the, uh, what was the party? Or There was like the party one. I can't remember now. I've tried to mentally block this out. And then you had the lion who was like the type, type A person who was the, the leader of the group and all the things. But then you had the golden retriever who's just the, the loyal, faithful, uh, happy person, peacekeeper. That was me, you know, and I would do anything for, for the team, but I didn't stand out for sure. So I had that. And then we stumble on this thing called Optivia. And it's been the greatest thing that's ever happened uh, to our life. It really has. It's, And uh, we'll insert that disclaimer right here. Check that out. A lot of hard work. A lot of things had to happen. I totally get it. You can find out more at optavia.com. And there's a link there that was also posted. The thing that almost killed us, food, our love for food. I talked about that in the very first episode with Tiffany. was the thing that saved our life and it changed us. And, and as Tiffany is like rising up, as a coach, as an independent Optavia coach, and as she is being asked to speak on more and more, uh, you know, boot camps and trainings and different things and Zooms, I was slowly, you know, pushed down again and, and before long pushed to the side. There was even one dude and I respected him so much. One of, uh, one of my, he's not really a mentor of mine. He was just a guy that I look, looked up to in the Optavia family one time. And this was our greatest achievement, right? We had hit the highest rank in the company. And I'll never forget, he came up and he's like, dude, you're married to such a rock star. And I was like, I know that, right? And then he, then he goes on to say, though, hey, your role is just to get out of the way. Let her do her thing. Let her do her thing. And I think he meant that as the utmost comp compliment to my wife. But at the same time, all I heard was, you're not good enough. There's been so many things along the way. There was even a coach on our team, on our team one time where I was just coming through. We had, we had had a lot of people over at the house for this party and I was coming through and Tiffany had left her shoes out. So I came and I got them and was taking them back to our room. And she said, uh, what are you just, is that what you do? Or are you the uh, guy who picks up the shoes or something like that? I, I don't remember it exactly, but it was an, another hit, another hit to me. Like, yeah, I guess, I guess that's what I do. Right. Here's the truth. You are not enough. You're not, you're not enough. I'm not enough. I remember, oh man, that's. Whew, I remember playing Russian roulette at the at the grocery store, every time when when we would go and we we would get our groceries and and I'm sitting there thinking, oh dear lord, you know, I've I've already got my, <laughs> I've already got my excuses to tell the poor little checkout girl or whatever you call them, <laughs> if my card doesn't work, I'm like, ah, I need to call the bank. Gosh, there's plenty of money in there, right? Because I was so embarrassed of what happens if it's declined. Because it had happened so many times. Or I was already kind of scanning through what can we do without? What what can I try to take off? Because I just didn't know if there was going to be enough money on the debit card to make that scan. I remember those feelings. I remember 
going to to restaurants and things and and going out to eat with friends or or even as our church staff when when we go out and we we tried you know we had to be there right and then we'd try like let's let's get water let's try to make it as cheap as possible let's share a meal and then still you're you're giving them that card mm -hmm. and you're hoping nothing embarrassing happens in front of your friends here's what i want you to get by all this You are not enough. But you can walk in confidence that God is enough. In fact, his, his word says that we can approach the throne of grace with confidence and boldness. We can do that because God did it all. He is enough. Jesus is enough. What is amazing is just like those times when we're playing Russian roulette at the uh, at the grocery store counter, and here here comes God. Maybe it doesn't. There's not enough money there because we were not enough. He comes up and he's like, "Bro, I got you. He's with me. I got you. On our own, we are not enough." But through Christ and his perfectly laid down life, we will always be enough because he's the trump card. He wins every time, every time. So the devil knows this, man. He knows this. He wants to try to deceive you. He wants to discourage you. He wants to lie to you because remember, he's the father of lies and tell you, you are not enough. Here's something I want you to remember. Whenever you do not feel peace, remember that God is enough. He is peace. He's the Prince of Peace. Whenever you feel like there is no comfort, remember God is enough. God is our comforter. Remember when you do not feel loved, Keep in mind that God is love. That's who he is. He's love. You don't know any other way. And whenever you're facing darkness all around you, remember God is light. Light always wins. Every time you flip the light switch on, bam, no matter how dark the room is, light wins every time. So walk in confidence knowing that you are enough, not because of anything you've done, but because of who he is, God is enough. I love you guys so much. I'm grateful for every single one of you who took the time to listen to me. I hope this, man, my prayer is that this has been a blessing to you and that you will find hope in Christ, that you will find hope in God because he is enough. And there's not anything in you will not find any hope in, in a certain denomination that you're a part of. And I'm not saying those are bad things. Please hear me. Uh, or, but I'm just saying, you know, we don't get to heaven. And he's like, well, hey, you you were a Baptist. You were an Assembly of God person. Uh, you were Church of Christ. You were Methodist. You, you earned this part of heaven. It, it doesn't work that way. He doesn't have tears, like tears of heaven. Like you qualify for this. And same with sin. He, he doesn't say, well, your sin is so bad. Your sin is so bad, there's just no grace for you. No, there's always enough because he is enough. I hope this has been a blessing to you guys. Love you dearly, and we will see you soon. God bless. Thanks so much for tuning in. If this episode helped you in any way, it would mean the world to me if you would leave a review and share it with somebody else. Thanks so much. I'll catch you next time.